I hope this finds you well. I always get a little chuckle when I hear presidential candidates talk about things they're going to change, things they're going to do, as it pertains to law, of course. Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution outlines the executive branch and the executive powers. Which brings us to today's case, Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer. The case was decided on June 2nd, 1952. The question before the court in this case was whether or not President Truman exceeded his powers by making a seizure of all steel mills in the United States. Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company was one of those steel mills. So here are the facts. In April of 1952, the Korean War was going on, and President Truman decided to issue an executive order directing the Secretary of Commerce, Mr. Charles Sawyer, to seize and operate most of the nation's steel mills. Now the reason behind this executive order issued by Truman was that the United States Steel Workers of America were planning to have a nationwide strike because they couldn't come to terms with the powers that be over wages. So President Truman got wind of this and decided to issue that executive order because with the country being at war, the government was relying on defense contractors. And those defense contractors were relying on the steel industry to, of course, produce steel, bullets, armor, those kinds of things. Now, Congress did not approve the order, although Truman did tell them about the order. He did tell Congress that he issued this executive order. So how we get to court is the petitioners applied for an injunction and the United States District Court for the District of Columbia issued the injunction, finding that the president or the government for that matter doesn't have the power to take control of the steel mills and then operate them under their own personal authority. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia stayed the injunction and stated the opposite, that the government may control the steel mills until the Supreme Court reviews the dispute. The case finally made its way to the United States Supreme Court under the Vinson Court. The Supreme Court brought up a number of reasons why the government cannot seize the steel mills under President Truman's executive order. First, they stated that no congressional statute authorizes the president to take possession of private property. Second, and this was against Truman's argument that his powers as commander-in-chief gave him the ability to seize the steel mills for the war effort, of course. But the Supreme Court found that military power as commander-in-chief does not extend to labor disputes. And finally, the president's power to see that the laws are faithfully executed refutes that idea that he is some sort of lawmaker. The president makes sure that the laws that Congress enacts are executed, not that he can create any laws. The court found that the president cannot make an executive order like this without the direction of Congress, or unless he has or she has that express authority in the United States Constitution, and that the president is limited to vetoing and suggesting laws, not creating laws. Interestingly enough, each of the majority members wrote their own opinions, or concurrences, I should say. But the one that's had probably the most impact, at least in my opinion, is Justice Robert Jackson's opinion. Justice Jackson's concurrence really gives us the spectrum of presidential power and is a framework that helps us understand how the president and Congress work together. So here's the spectrum. When the president acts with Congress's express or implied authorization, then that's when the president's power is at its strongest. When the president acts without Congress, them either granting or denying the president's actions, well, that's that middle zone where we're unsure of whether the president has the power to do something. Unless, of course, we look at the Constitution. And then finally, when the president acts contrary or 
in opposition to Congress's express or implied will, well, then that's what Justice Jackson calls the lowest ebb. And that's where Youngstown Sheet and Tube comes into play. The dissent, written by Chief Justice Vinson, felt differently than the majority, of course, and they felt that the national emergency of being in the Korean War gave the president the inherent authority to take control of steel mills, or anything else for that matter it would seem, to further the war effort. Vinson also pointed out that Congress could have at any point responded with disapproval or approval, but they didn't. So where are they now? Youngstown's sheet and tube is no more. The trademark name and its logo expired in 2014. Thanks for watching.